Hi everyone, today we work on closure. Why not? We've seen some very different languages uh, so far and closure is going to be surprising to many. I've not written any closure over the last 10 years and I have just a basic understanding of the of the language so this is going to be fun. Let's start um, by reading the about section of, of Clojure. So Clojure is a dynamic programming language that targets the Java virtual machine. Designed as a general purpose language, Clojure combines the approachability of a scripting language with a robust infrastructure for multi-threading programming. This is something I remember from the time when I was tangentially working on it. Um, the fact that uh, a lot of the languages designed around data structure, data structures and the manipulation of data structures and the language relies on immutability as a tenet to ensure high efficiency multi-threaded uh, execution. Um, Clojure is predominantly a functional programming language and features a rich set of immutable persistent data structures. Here we go. It is open source and information about contributing can be found here. Rich Hickey, the creator of Clojure, wanted a modern Lisp for functional programming. Symbiotic with the established Java platform and designed for concurrency. Thus, Clojure was born. And if you haven't, if you don't know this name, Rich Hickey, I, I recommend you go and check out some YouTube videos where Rich Hickey is giving presentations, not only about closure, but about programming in general. He's one of those uh, very insightful speakers and any talk I've watched from him usually uh, leaves you something that, that you will carry into your uh, uh, idea of how programming languages should work. So very interesting, do, ch do check him out. Here are a couple of quotes that exemplify the goals of closure. Good design is not about making grand plans, but about taking things apart. Okay. Programming is not about typing, it's about thinking. Oh, this is another big deal because unlike the languages we've seen so far, um, Elixir being a bit of an exception, uh, there's no such a thing as types uh, in, um, in closure as far as I, as, as far as I remember. So we are not going to be defining classes uh, or anything like that. At most, we're going to be defining data structures that resemble maybe structs, I guess, uh, but nothing any more complicated. Uh, and we're not going to have uh, function definitions with type signatures, with, with, with type annotations or, or anything like that. Uh, so this is interesting. And then from the syntax, you can see uh, this might remind you of, of any Lisp. Uh, and by Lisp, we mean uh, not the common speech in like in, in Padiment. Uh, here we go. So Lisp, it's a family of programming languages with a long history and a distinctive fully parenthesized prefix notation, which is why they all look a bit the same. And you will often find, well, you will find an operator and then uh, the arguments for the operation. Um, so in this case, I guess we are, I guess we are defining a string here, or maybe not. Maybe we are calling, yeah, I really don't know. We're gonna figure it out very, very soon. Maybe we're calling, calling a function on an argument and then wrapping that uh, result into a, an array. I really don't know. We'll figure it out together. Um, and one thing that is uh, interesting about Lisps is, uh, Lisp languages is, uh, the fact that the, the the code itself can be interpreted as a data is interpreted as a data structure by the uh, interpreter um, and so can be fed into the um, other programs and so metaprogramming in Lisp becomes very very easy because everything you write is just data that can be then transformed again and turned into other programs that can be run. Okay, enough of talking. Uh, let's join the track and get started with the usual hello world, which might already 
gives us some surprise. Um, let's see if there's anything special about this. Uh, we are a couple of things we can look at. So NS is probably something like namespace. Uh, so identifies the namespace for the for the code we are writing, and then we are defining the hello function which I guess has no argument, so I, we, we can read this as a function with no parameters and then we're just returning a string. Okay, I'll just try and trust the, the system so far and uh, see if we can learn something with the next set of concepts. Processing is taking a bit of time, but we can mark this as complete anyway. And look at some concepts. Okay, let us start from the basics. Uh, we're back to the concept of bi binding, which again, if you come from a different background, maybe you can just think variables for now, and um, uh, that's good enough. Enclosure binding a value to a name is referred to as a var. Top level global vars are similar to constant in other languages, but are commonly re redefined to facilitate dynamic development. Okay, um, top level vars are defined using def. So def is just setting a binding and giving a name to a constant for now. The def and macro can be used to define a function taking zero or more arguments. We've seen it in the previous example. A function always returns the result of the last expression in its body so we're not going to have to explicitly return whatever comes last is the thing that is going to be returned by the function okay so for example looking at the definition of the add function we're, we we can see that the function comes with two uh, arguments and we just apply the plus operator to x and y. As you can see, there's no type annotation. We don't know if x and y are integer or whatever. Um, we are just uh, telling uh, the, the program what to do with the two values, and we are assuming that the plus operator is going to be available and have some sort of meaning when we, when we call the function. Invoking a function is done by specifying its name and passing arguments for each of the function's parameters. Okay, and we've seen this before. We prepend the name of the uh, function we want to call and then pass the arguments. Um, and what this does is it assigns the value returned by add to three to the uh, var named five. Functions and values in closure can only be used after they have been defined. Using it before it has been defined results in a compiler error. Okay. White space has no significance other than formatting, so we can go on a new line, use multiple spaces, whatever we want. Uh, function vars are organized in namespaces, what we had sort of inferred in the, or speculated around in the first example. Uh, and um, defined by NS, okay. Closure supports two types of comments. Single line comments are preceded by semicolon, and the comment form is used to prevent evaluation of everything between comment parentheses and uh, close parentheses. Fair enough. So let's start with our now overly familiar lasagna example. We will define some sort of constant and we'll probably use def to define the constant and then we'll define a couple of functions with def n. Was it def n? Yes, I think so. Uh, to set the remaining time for the cooking of the lasagna and um, the elapsed time since the beginning of the preparation. Okay, so we set a namespace, which is the Lucius uh, lasagna. The expected time is 40 minutes. Uh, the remaining time is going to be 10 minutes that, okay, it takes in the actual time. So what do we return here? We just return expected time oh nice we have some sort of auto completion no we don't but fine we have expected time minus actual time and that should be it. that's just oh yeah and of course we need to 
prepend the operator and then follow with the parameters so I'm using the minus operator and then passing two arguments expected time and actual time straight away we notice there's this weird note this weird convention on variable names where we use dashes um, rather than a camel case or, or a snake case approach fine by me okay uh, this seems to be working okay uh, just takes a bit of getting used to and then prep time we go back to the idea of layers and uh, you know we can the, the cost of, of, of preparing a layer is uh, twice is, is two minutes so we're gonna say something like layer time and return two and this defines a constant and then we can just use this constant here and say do the multiplication between layer time and uh, num layers and I'm really going against what my brain is telling me in order not to or actually against the automatic typing of uh, my fingers in, in having to put the in not writing any comma or uh, putting the operator between uh, operands um, this also reminds me of the Polish notation. Is that what it's called? Uh, yeah, it's also known. Okay, postfix notation. So, Polish notation, also known as normal Polish notation or Polish prefix notation, or simply prefix notation, is a mathematical notation in which operators precede their operands in contrast to the more common infix notation. Uh, yeah, and so this is what we're doing basically. We're just uh, using the Polish notation to express um, not only mathematical operation, but any, any sort of operation, call any function on uh, a set of arguments. Okay, so I think prep time should work. Let's see. It does. And now we just need to define the total time function which given the number of layers and the actual time the lasagna is spent in the oven returns the total time uh, elapsed uh, and this is a great opportunity to call functions within functions um, so what we want to do is we want to compute the prep time of num layers and then we want to add this value to the actual time. This is a bit mind-bending at the beginning, but I think we can get used to it by the end of the session. And then we won't be able to go back, maybe, actual time. So this is it. Oh, nice. Okay, the first concept felt good. Let's see where we can go next. Lists, let's go for lists, then conditionals. Tracks on tracks and tracks. So enclosure lists are collections. Okay. Uh, parenthesis express lists. Closure lists can be created in one of two ways. We can use the list function or you can quote a literal list. Okay, we'll see what that means. Lists are special because Closure will treat them as calls. It expects the call to start with an operator, which is usually a function. The remaining items of the list are considered operands, meaning they become the function's argument. Fine. Uh, I guess it's going to make more sense when we when we see one. Closure's special treatment of lists is why we cannot create a list literal directly. Uh, quoting a list using quote or its shorthand indicates that the list should not be evaluated. Something like a lazy evaluation, maybe? Unlike some other languages, uh, closure lists are heterogeneous. Heterogeneous meaning they can contain multiple types of item internally. It's something we've seen in Elixir as well a couple of days ago. Unlike other lists, uh, an empty list enclosure is through the. So not equivalent to nil or false good to know and this is just a matter of convention i guess okay so we start with a quote 
and then enter the list or we use the list function fine let's see so we need to create a new list before you can add languages so the idea here is we have we are processing a list of programming languages and we start with an empty list and then we can add add languages check which languages are in the list remove languages doing some sort of pop on the on the list count the languages and um, and then do it maybe write down a little little script is that that's what we're being asked to do so let's see okay uh, task one before you can add languages you'll need to start by creating a new list define a function that returns an empty list and as we've seen from the explanation this should be it. so I'm using the quote and then giving it an empty list here let's see if task one is enough uh, if this is enough for task one yes it is okay adding a new language to the list uh, this is interesting as you explore exorcism and find languages you want to learn you'll need to be able to add them to your list define a function to add a new language at the beginning of your list hmm how do we do this so we have hmm, a language list and then we have the new language and we want to prepend or append is it no prepend the the new language to the list and how do we go about it because I guess we could well I guess we can just pick it up so closure append item to list or prepend actually mm. we're looking at vectors but it should be the same thing Cons list closure doc okay list of one and then yeah this is not what we want list star let's try list star it seems to be expanding the arguments of well expanding the list in the second position into the elements of the list let's see so if we say list star lang and then lang list it will i think expand lang list and just prepend lang let's see nice test passed moving on to selecting the first language in the list uh, we're going to go back to the documentation so we have a language list and we want to extract an element let's see um, Let's see, access. We are in core. It's also a good way of uh, browsing the documentation. So list under L, list. Okay, there you go. And what about access? or get and okay nice everything is uh, done by calling a function right at the end of the day and so and then the list then the position and then a default value I guess yeah collection index and what happens if not found which is a it this already gives us some insight into how much of a paradigm shift we have to go through when working with closure as opposed to other languages so 
when accessing an element in a list rather than having to deal with a potential exceptions being raised due to the uh, index not being a valid one, we actually provide a default value, uh, which will be returned if the index is not right for the, for the collection. And that straight away puts you into a completely different mindset where, you know, exceptions are handled, are handled um, straight away in a very um, grace, graceful way. Uh, although, interestingly, uh, get returns, okay, returns the value at the index, get returns nil if index out of bounds and throws an exception unless not found is supplied. Okay, so not found is actually an optional um, argument. And if you don't supply the not found, then an exception will be thrown. So I'm, I'm curious to see if we're gonna get there, how exceptions are handled in, in closure. But okay, we have enough. Uh, I guess we can do n, and maybe there's also a first. Maybe there is a first. Maybe we can just, you know, make it up as we go. Let's say first language list. Yeah, indeed, we can do that. So uh, we can guess a bit more, I guess. Remove the first language added to the list. And this is some sort of uh, pop operation. I wonder, again, what's the best way of browsing the documentation? Because you don't have Usually when browsing docs, you go to the type you're calling functions on, and then either you find a module like in Elixir, or you find a type, and then you browse the documentation for that type or module. But here, these functions actually apply to whatever, whatever uh, matches the concept of a collection. So you're not gonna be finding uh, that, that so easily. So this search box must be very, very powerful to get you where you need to be um, in a timely fashion. So for a list or queue returns a new list or queue without the first element. So yeah, pop is what we want. I'll do pop. And as you can see, as you as you've read, this returns a new list rather than making a side effect on the existing list. Okay count languages we can guess there might be some sort of length or size let's try this a length let's go straight to a length and see if this is what we're looking for a length there you go Returns the length of the Java array. Okay, probably not what we want because we are actually working on sort of native closure lists. Uh, set it for size. Nothing found. Length did not. What about len? Print length. Is there some also C something something? Uh, yeah, C also into array, but here. Okay, let's try a length and see how this fails. That's going to be useful. In like, uh, yeah, this is what happens, right? So we get an exception that says argument is not an array. So we get a runtime exception telling us that we are trying to call a function on a data structure that doesn't match an array and so we get we get this um, at runtime other languages would probably prevent us from even writing this in the first place like fail at compilation time right so something to keep in mind okay so closure size of list or collection we can say count okay why didn't we see count oh I didn't even go for count, I was thinking size and length, but yeah, fine, count will do. Okay, nice, and then the last one is, creates an empty list, adds closure and lisp, removes lisps, lisp, adds Java and JavaScript, then finally returns a count of the total number of languages. Okay, and this is uh, an attempt 
uh, to get us to write some scripts, right? And reuse some, some of our functions, which is going to be fun because we can reuse all the functions we just defined. So we start from new list. I think we do new list on no arguments. And I think we can just call it like that. And then we add closure and lisp to the list. So we do add language, we call it twice, right? So we do add language and add language wants the list first and then the language. So it's going to be closure and then we do and I don't know if we need to be explicit. I think we need to be explicit here with parentheses. Yeah. So we call new list. We add a new language. Then we add another language. So mind we have not read much about strings, but I think this is how we define strings. Hopefully, we add Lisp. Then we remove Lisp, which is the last element added. So we can use remove language. We'll think about how we can format this in a way that makes it not terrible. So we do remove language and this thing. And if you have suggestions on formatting, fire away. Remove list adds Java and JavaScript. So we add language. This is getting a bit difficult to handle, but also we can do a def, right? We can do, um, Okay, let, let's try and say, let's see how far we can go without defining a variable here. Just for the fun. Uh, add language Java, then add language Ooh. JavaScript. Capital S. Okay, almost there. And finally, returns a count of the total number of languages. And then a count, which is count languages on this. And this is what we return. And now we try and format this in a way that, I don't know, makes it less confusing. Um, Can we do something like we can put the parameters with does it use one level of indentation or two 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 um, two spaces so we do count languages one two add languages of one two add language of one two of remove language of might sound like a madman okay um, something like this as readable as it can be right we start from a new list we then add closure we then add lisp we remove a language and then we add java and then we add javascript and then we count the languages as easy as it can be. Let's run this. Um, can we cast a persistent stack? Okay, what's the matter? Mm -hmm. Oh no. Now figuring out what might be wrong becomes a bit complicated, doesn't it? Turns account of the total number of languages. So count and the error is on cons cannot be cast to persistent stack i don't know why it's trying to do that but we can check where the error occurs and we can totally just do what if we do this we do aux for auxiliary and we do a def Aux and then pass this. Do we get some information on the line when where an error happens? 
too many arguments for def. Yes, I forgot some parentheses here. Uh, maybe. And we're probably a bit under a number of parentheses here. Okay. He would like to know where this error happened, but okay, let's see. If I do this and run, we're still trying to cast something into something else. Okay, we have to be explicit about the empty arguments, wrong number of args. No, yeah, so this is actually fine. So, what if we just return a new list? And then count languages on your list and delete everything else. That's it. Let's see how this goes. Count not supported on this type. Am I calling the wrong thing? New list. Hmm. On this type. On RT. Count languages, then new list. And this is an empty list. What if I do. I don't know whether is it maybe that I should wrap this? No. Cannot call. What if I do empty all this? Okay. And then it says count not supported on this type count not supported on this type so how do I determine the length of a list length of a size of list length of a sequence count this works hmm okay I think there's something wrong with types, with the types I'm using. What if I do count languages on an empty list? Okay, now this works. And if I do count languages on new list, which should return exactly the same thing, Okay, yeah, this works. Uh, so was it maybe a matter of um, wrapping new list in parentheses? Yeah, maybe. Okay, so if I go back to the original code, <clears throat> I think this should work though, right? So if I do count languages on Oops. Hmm, still not happy. And language new list closure. Okay. Let's take it one step at a time, okay? And maybe you can comment this out. Nice. Okay. So we know that if we do count languages on a new list, things are fine. We just get the wrong number. Okay. And we can try and add a language 
to the list. Oh, was, oh, is it maybe that strings are not? Maybe I'm not defining strings properly. That would be very unfortunate. Okay, count languages, add language, and then closure. Okay. So this is fine. Up to this point, we are good. And we can also try an, uh, another language. Uh, which is Lisp. And this should also work. Maybe the removal is causing some trouble. Uh, remove language. Call in this thing. Maybe return something that doesn't make sense here. It does. So remove language seems to have some issue. Like popping is um, not working as expected. Let's see. Um, official docs. Or list or queue returns a new list queue without the first item. Okay. Let's see how it's used. This seems okay. And if I call pop rather than remove, is this gonna work? It does not. It doesn't seem to be able to do some sort of conversion. Cons would be an empty list and it cannot be cast to an I persistent stack. I wonder if um, making this a mutable Thing will change anything no it's not making it any different let's look for something about this error maybe we'll learn something pop turns in vector let's do this <clears throat> try and simplify the error message transient vector doesn't even exist okay Hmm. We seem to be getting into some sort of conundrum, which we don't want to get into. Let's see if there's other ways of uh, removing the first element. Let's see. Remove the first language from the list. And uh, let's see what the suggestion is. rest. I wonder what the difference between rest Ooh, maybe pop has something to do with ah, I really don't know returns a possibly empty sequence of the items after the first okay called seek on its argument I would expect to see a C also pop or something for a list or queue returns a new list without the first item I seem to be dealing with some quirks or maybe something we didn't understand or I didn't understand about pop but fine by me let's do rest and see this working okay now it's just a matter of we don't have the error anymore we just need to make this script complete and rather than counting with pop, we will count with rest. And um, no, still the same issue. Okay, def helps remove language. Pop. So this works. What if I do rest here and change this to remove language? Okay, then what? 
what is the issue and then it's just a matter of adding a bunch of uh, languages isn't it okay what if I do add language in this and the language I want to add is Java Okay, and then what if I add another language? And that language is JavaScript. got not equal three JavaScript Java closure what seems to be the problem here adds closure and Lisp done removes Lisp okay adds Java and JavaScript yeah then finally returns a count of the total number of languages. Expected three, but got not equal three. JavaScript, Java, and Clojure. Is it because we're not, I think count languages is doing what it's supposed to do. So just calling count, right? Now I'm just a bit puzzled. So parentheses were needed, otherwise maybe count, maybe without the parentheses it thought that count was called without arguments. Count languages, mm, a bit awkward. Just a spelling mistake, okay. Right. And why didn't the other version work? We're not going to give up this easily. So we have remove language on a new list, closure, lisp, and then we assign this to bind aux to that. Then we do add language Java. Maybe this parenthesis is wrong. It definitely is wrong. Here we just want to do add language Java, then add language JavaScript, then count languages here. I think this, this should work. Yeah, and we can live without this very long um, set of calls, and then maybe, ooh. A bit more readable so we assign we bind aux to this part of the computation then reuse aux to add a couple of languages and then count the languages and we are good to go this was extremely painful and frustrating i don't know why that had to be the case so if you're familiar with the difference between pop and rest it would be lovely to hear a deep dive on it i'm not going to do that right now uh, but okay, and we can mark this as complete. Let's see if there's any recommendation, but maybe this has not been implemented for closure. I have to say this took a bit longer than expected, um, but there is something there about 
pop and rest which is uh, yeah would deserve a bit more of an inspection so by all means you can add some comments and make do a favor to the next person that will uh, stumble upon this okay going back to concepts shall we go for conditionals because the list burnt, have, burnt us already quite hard um, conditionals what you would expect I guess um, if is the most important conditional expression it consists of a condition and a then and an optional else if we'll only evaluate the branch selected by the conditional good to know uh, cond is a series of tests and expressions each test is evaluated in order and the expression is evaluated and returned for the first true set true tests okay so we go from the top down and then The expression is evaluated and returned for the first true test so only the first true test will will run okay so likely this is a good case switch kind of uh, conditional statement let's see if we can do some car assembling so we'll be writing code to analyze the production of an assembly line in a car factory the assembly line speed can range from 0 to 10 I think we are familiar with this exercise by now at its lowest speed 1 we can produce 221 cars but then as we increase the speed unfortunately the defect rate goes up and up and so we want to calculate the production rate per hour including the um, computation related to the success rate and then the number of working items produced per minute and it feels like we're going to be using the con statement then uh, okay so let's see production rate given the speed we want to evaluate con the speed and say if it's less then and then we really need to look at the table I don't think we need to set the 0% success rate at zero speed uh, we can just say if it's less than 5 then it's going to be like speed is less than 5 then we're going to return 100 or let's say 1.0 if it is less than 9 then we're returning 0 0.9 and then if it's less than 10 we return 80% and if it's less than or equal let's say equal 10 then we return 77 interesting to notice how the equal sign can be used for comparison here because binding variables doesn't use the equal sign so there's a spare operator uh, available and it can be used uh, so no double equal sign I guess uh, enclosure not not used in the same way we do in other languages uh, okay so now that we have the set of conditions and what they produce what do we have here we have the defect rate or the success rate and we can just multiply this and so we can do a def success rate equals sorry without the equal of course and then just wrap this in parentheses so we have def success rate we bind success rate to the cond okay this reads okay and then we can actually close all the parentheses in one in one go and then what do we do with the success rate we just do a multiplication of success rate multiplied by 221 which is supposed to be the cars per hour so let's call them cars per 
hour and define a, con a constant out here that tries uh, 221 is gonna work uh, is it def? we need to put this somewhere else Okay, I think this uh, kind of works. Uh, let's see. What are we missing? Um, equals this we're not really multiplying anything we're just returning oh we might have to do some sort of casting what uh what am i missing here oh speed matters right sorry i forgot the speed so cars per hour times success rate times speed so times speed of the rest yeah there you go and then for 10 <laughs> we have some rounding error um, yeah so we're okay we just need to we just have some rounding error so can we round to the first decimal digit and will that exist as a round one just making it up as we go could not found one around okay so No flooring, no ceiling, floor, no. Um, why? We have float. Maybe there's some, some recommendation on the instructions. Uh, the value return is a double. Okay. Do we need to convert to double before we do other things so double double coerce to double what if we curse to double before running the operation so we do does that make any difference I don't think so and I can kill the round Still no luck. Uh, what's the recommendation on the instructions? Yeah, we're familiar with the conditional expression. Maybe zero seventy seven. 77. Uh, maybe changing the order of the operation will uh, get us there. So what if we multiply by speed first and then by success rate? Java is weird like that, meaning the JVM might have some works um, so we can work around yeah um, yeah that that did the trick so rounding error so multiplying speed by cars per hour first and then multiplying by this for by the success rate actually did the trick blame the JVM moving on uh, working items so this is about working items per minute and I think it's just a matter from what I can remember of um, dividing by 60 minutes so dividing the production rate by 60 minutes production rate speed and then 
we just say divide production rate speed by 60 and then we just need to find what the right format is for example we are we just want an integer rather than a double and so we can probably just say something like int and coerce the double or float into an integer indeed we can okay great marking is done and we learned something about a few things to be fair so this was less frustrating i have to say uh, returning to the exercise for a moment let's see where we are we have now completed three exercises and if i go back to the syllabus we can move on and look into booleans we'll have to sooner or later so let's do that and then maybe into strings strings are always fun um, they should also be very easy to manipulate in uh, closure as far as i remember but before we do that let's take a break we are back learning closure going through the basics of the language um, we've seen lists conditionals numbers function and variable or binding definition and we should go on and uh, look at booleans now represented as true or false all values are logically either true or false the only false values are false and nil we haven't encountered nil yet which is interesting like we've not had to deal with that uh, so far all other values are logically true I always prefer to be explicit about turning things into boolean rather than letting the language figure out whether something is or not nil and then based on that evaluate the conditional but it's good to know that everything that is not false or nil will evaluate to false predicate functions which is functions that return a boolean will typically end with a question mark um, and this is just a convention and this is something we've seen in uh, ruby and crystal so far so there is some um, connection to what other languages do as well the core library includes functions for logical operators such as not and an or and i think that's all we need we've gone through the um, exercise about analyzing infiltr infiltration before and so that should be all we need really this is a an exercise where we are simulating some sort of rpg where Annalyn is trying to um, free a prisoner and um, in order to do that uh, she has to go undetected uh, through the prison and uh, it's important that the guard or spy or whatever are sleeping when when she tries and, and free the prisoner so let's see what we need to implement uh, we need to figure out whether we can fast attack and that depends on whether the knight is awake or not if the knight is not awake then uh, we can fast attack uh, if so so we will just negate um, the night state of awakeness uh, like this mm. and that that just works and then let's look at the second task which is about spies can spy whether or not Annalyn can spy based on the state of knight, archer and prisoner and this is something where we need to look at the spec a bit more in that uh, the group can be spied upon if at least one of them is awake otherwise spying is a waste of time fair enough so we want to do an or one of them has to be awake so we can just say we can just do a, an or on the three of them so either this or
the prisoner is awake. Yeah, let's see. Okay, and then signaling. What's signaling about? The prisoner can be signaled using bird sounds if the prisoner is awake and the archer, the archer is sleeping as archers are trained in bird signaling so they could intercept the message, which is something you probably already knew, but there you have it. Um, so we need the archer to be asleep. Prisoner is awake and archer sleeping. Okay, so we want an end condition uh, on no, not archer awake. and prisoner awake so the two conditions have to be true at the same time okay and finally for in order to release the prisoner there's some more complicated conditions because Annalyn has a dog and the dog will play a big part in it so what I've done in other exercises uh, in other languages for the same exercise was to define uh, what happens with the dog and then what happens without the dog and then take uh, the or of the two like so and then we can define uh, what happens with or without the dog and uh, just take the uh, disjunction of the two So if uh, her pet dog is with her, she can rescue the prisoner if the archer is asleep. So we have to have, we have to return something like archer away. So not archer awake. Uh, the knight is scared of the dog and the archer will not have time to get ready before Annalyn and the prisoner escape. So this condition should just be as easy as this. Uh, on the other hand, if we don't have the dog, uh, wrong line. If we don't have the dog, then uh, the prisoner, yeah, must be awake, and the knight and the archer must both be asleep. So we can do an end on the fact. Well, it's going to be a couple of ends. So this is one way of writing this thing. Right? you have not not so the knight must not be awake the archer must not be awake the prisoner has to be awake interesting how the syntax ends up shaping the way you actually write your code and maybe the way you think eventually as well uh, so without the dog, the prisoner have to, has to be awake. Archer and knight must be asleep. Let's see. And this compiles first and then the rest. Now uh, release prisoner, every, uh, everyone asleep, dog absent. Oh, I forgot. I forgot to actually add a fundamental condition, which is whether or not the dog is there, right? So uh, dog present. And one could go for an if, but I thought it would be nice, given that we're playing with, um, like, just dealing with, with booleans, it would be nice to just do everything with booleans. So in this case, we do dog present is an end. And then on the other side, we do end. Dog not present. So Hopefully this makes sense, and we can just do run and submit. Brilliant, very nice exercise, um, and I like that we skip, like we managed to skip the use of um, if and condition. Let's look at more concepts. I think it's time for strings. Yes, uh, surely, 
strings are very easy to manipulate in uh, um, enclosure given that everything is about data manipulation in Clojure. And we've seen this exercise before with other languages. The idea is that we're going to format a log uh, message uh, specifying the level uh, or at which the, the message should be logged between info warning and error. This was an opportunity for us to look into enums in, uh, uh, in Rust yesterday, which was really good. Um, let's see how things are in, uh, in Clojure. So we've already seen how strings are simply defined with quotes and we can then bind them to a variable or a name. And what else do we need? I guess a string interpolation would be nice. Uh, so we, we can just go and check out the closure string library and see what what's available there. Maybe I can just replace this with string. Yep, we can. And can I say interpolation? No. Let's see if the generic docs do something for us. We have... Maybe we must require this package and then we can... STR. Oh, this is interesting. So we need to prepend the name of the function with the package it comes from. In this particular case, as we are saying, require closure string as str, and then str slash, and then the name of the function. This is very um, instructive. So we can actually. Oh, it's been done for us already. So that's nice. And we'll probably have to trim uppercase capitalize replace so this is gonna come in handy what about I seem to remember that in order to um, join strings that that should be simple enough let's see hmm also apologies this might be a bit small for you so let me make it a bit bigger so we have uppercase trim starts with split lines split reverse replace lowercase and I guess was there upcase as well yes uppercase includes index of what about concatenation we'll figure it out so takes a string representing a log line and returns its message with white space white space trimmed So we go from a formatted message to just the message. Okay. How do we do that? So one thing we can do is we can do a split. And look at this documentation for split. We do the string we want to split and the regular expression that we want to use to split. In our case, the string is going to be enough. We don't need to go into regular expressions. But I can see regular expressions start with a, uh, with a hash sign. Uh, let's try this out. So if we do split s hash, hash sign and then colon space, I'm expecting that to produce two. A list of two elements and then uh, if we go back to the exercise where we ma were manipulating lists there was a an end function that was extracting an element from a list right uh, if I go back to is there a list package maybe not maybe just the core package and then what was that and then look for end returns the value this looks like end collection and then index so if we do end collection and then the index is the second one and then we would have to trim for from spaces right we can do that later let's see how well we do with this cannot resolve split right so we need to go str package name slash split and now this should work and then trying to access the second element well that would be the element on index one so my bad and now we are passing 
a few tests and of course we need to train the white space as well right and if i go back to the documentation for the string package we notice that trim is actually there so we can just call trim after we've extracted this so like this and uh, i guess there's a convention that we're training white spaces if we don't give any white space parameter again we need to prepend the function name with str better okay uh, and we can now move on to the second part of the exercise i think which is about log level which extracts the log level rather than the message itself right so we can take a similar approach and then leave it for later to possibly refactor the code a bit to reuse some of the functionality or maybe we'll just be happy with this so the first thing that comes to mind is let's just extract the second element or sorry the, the first element in the list that will return error all capital but we actually want a lowercase version of the of the error and so what we can do is we can call low str slash low lowercase there you go yeah and test this low case uh, did i lower yeah miss a couple of characters and now we're getting error oh and also we need to trim the square brackets which we can probably do with trim with some argument so trim s removes white spaces is there a c also trim how trim new line we actually want to be able to specify a parameter for this Please. So in other languages, we were able to trim on things that were not the white space, to so just remove any space, including the square bracket, for example. Here, we might have to just call replace. Okay, that's good enough, I think. We can do it before we... So maybe it makes sense to just extract the error string, error, into a name binding and once we have that we can apply a couple of transformation on it we can say replace target with some character let's just look at the documentation for replace oh a regular expression so we can do let's try this we can say oh my way outside of my comfort zone here but can we do this a segmentation fault okay i managed to break I managed to break something badly okay what if i say replace i need to escape the square bracket i think Okay, now that works, and, but I also want to... I basically want to say anything that is either the square bracket 
opening or closing replaced with nothing. But then we need this, the, the dash, right? That's why I was thinking, oof, regular expression, regular expression, place, um, Let's see. But here we go. Replace square bracket org match square brackets. Matches a square bracket. Just the slash in front of it. Okay, what if I want to capture both? Um, this is not what we were looking for. Match anything enclosed by square brackets one match square brackets oh no we're going places that we don't want to go <clears throat> i think we're closed just the Okay, match. You can omit the first backslash with match either bracket. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Something similar to this. Let's see. No dash. Dash wouldn't make any sense. That would just probably capture the dash itself. <clears throat> we're getting stuck overflow regular expressions really are magic and great at breaking things um, just testing here okay so why is it not liking this not too convinced about Why is it not like in this? I think this worked earlier, right? So if I do A, just do whatever here. And here, just go for the opening square bracket. This worked. Now, this is puzzling, right? Because now I just wanted to replace the closing square bracket and it's seg faulty okay let's not get any deeper into this we'll find another way how do we combine these functions to get something that we like uh, for example we could just say drop the last element right like would would rest even work on uh, so if we say replace the closing bracket and then forget about everything else and then rather than replacing we say rest of this meaning drop the last element if strings are interpreted as um, a list and it does do something that we like it just needs to then join this thing somehow because what is it what is that even is that a it's a list right we can maybe i mean I'm, again not very proud of this code but just trying to learn something new here can i join could not resolve symbol join I did see join somewhere where was it was it not here I did see join somewhere closure set string it returns a string of all elements in collection okay into the string okay package that makes sense because it returns a string str join 
segmentation fault. Okay. So if I lowercase error string, I get this almost almost the error I'm looking for. And then we could split. What if I split this? Split. Split. With just any can I do this? Okay. I think I'm getting where I want. Uh, so now we get this gets us a list of characters. If we can discard the two outer characters, so we know that if we do if we call rest on this, we lose the first character. This is going to be embarrassingly inefficient, but hey, what can we do? Okay, and then how do we drop the last element? And then we're going to join. So if we go back to the core library, back to collections basically, um, last. So we do rest and look at, see also next drop and rest. Pop and first. We don't want to use pop. That's uh, painful. That was painful. And uh, turns a lazy sequence. Turns a sequence. <laughs> Closure collection drop last. There you go. Just as easy as that. Something like this. You gotta love this, okay, and then let's see if we're getting there. Right, and then we can oh by we join now and then we go to hell all together. <laughs> String string slash join. There you go, easy. <laughs> okay, we'll reflect on this in our spare time, okay? We can't just be on the stream for the rest of the day. So let's take this win, small as it is, and reflect on how to replace square brackets. We can, one, one thing we can take away from this is that the uh, string package is not very extensive and so a lot of the functionality you might have to define yourself or import some more evolved library to help us get through the limitations of this okay with that let's move to the next part which is going to be hopefully a bit simpler which is about reformatting a log line this is actually great because we can reuse the previous functions so we can say get me the message and then we can say get me the level so log level of s and we want to just join this string and we'll, we'll have to do that in a certain order right and with some so on one side operation completed that's how the so message is the first thing that appears. Then we have the log level in parentheses, and I wonder if we can just do looking at the string package if there's anything to prepend or you know let's do closure string concat. Let's see. So we have str x and y, some string, okay. str one, two, three, okay. So just str and then a set of strings should work. 
set of strings. So we can just do, rather than join, we can do str. I'm wondering though, because we imported string, string package as str, this is not going to work, is it? Let's see. I don't think it will. But we would want message s and then parenthesis open and then close with a space in the middle. And we want to lowercase lower case the log level now it's going to complain about the absence of a terror no actually it knows what to do okay okay this was painful but it's done now we can look forward to our future when the strings are done we can go back to concepts and think about what comes next but also let's review the number of exercises. oh we've completed six exercises but folks this means we're done for the day which is amazing we took a bit more time than expected and I have to go and uh, study my, my fundamentals of uh, regular expressions but thanks for bearing with me um, I think I'll see you tomorrow and I've um, launched a, a small poll on, on Twitter to understand what language I'm going to be working on tomorrow uh, it seems Kotlin is going strong and, and Julia is uh, second uh, at the moment I'm very surprised that Swift didn't get more love, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, whatever wins here, tomorrow we're going to do uh, a bit of practice with that language, and I think we will get a chance to get the second most voted language as well, so keep on uh, getting involved. Thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow for some more uh, exorcism uh, basics in the language uh, that comes out of that poll. See you.